it's time for us to turn our attention to the other big breaking GA news story this morning, and that is that Tipperary will be looking for a new football manager, a new hurling manager, rather, after Liam Sheedy announced that he was stepping aside after his three year term. I'm delighted to say Paddy Stapleton is with us this morning to talk about Liam Sheedy's legacy. A, a two time uh, All Ireland winning manager in different eras, uh, and obviously a player of great renown as well. When it comes to write the history of Tipperary GA, Paddy, Liam Sheedy's name is going to be right up there in the pantheon of the all-time greats. Yeah, that's correct, Jerry. Yeah, he'll be he'll be right up there at the top. And I think for me, looking back at it, the way he pulled a team like in two thousand and eight, Tipperary were after losing to Exford in the quarter final of the All Ireland in two thousand and seven. Brendan Cummins was after being left out of the team. Owen Kelly was after being left out of the team. Um, and it was really in disarray. Uh, I remember being at the match because Wexford weren't a big team at the time. And I suppose Tipper in free fall. Um, he came in in 2008. I was lucky enough to be brought in the same year. Um, one of five new guys in the panel was all there was. And he took more or less the same group of players and reached the All-Ireland semi-final. Uh, narrowly lost out to Watford. And won the county's first Munster final since 2001. And I suppose that was the beginning of Tipperary being properly competitive again, which they probably hadn't been since Nicky English in 2002. I think as well the fact that, you know, we know how the uh, awfully stopping the five in a row has gone down in GA lore as time goes on and on and on. And, uh, you know, maybe Limerick do five in a row hurling, we'll see, and that becomes less of a story. But stopping the then greatest hurling team of all time from doing five in a row was an absolutely sensational thing that, like, when you come back and you back it up again with another All-Ireland uh, with a, another entirely different team as well. It just, again, further suggests that here is somebody who knows how hurling works so fundamentally that he's able to adapt to different eras. I think that's that's a huge thing. Uh, that's absolutely massive. I suppose the only thing he had is coming in with Tipperary in 2008. He was quite a young manager, but such a huge figurehead. Um, Kilkenny at the time had it over everybody, really, and, and they were still in their peak uh, in 09 and 10, and we were quite a young team. So... Um, I think he needed a hugely strong leader. I know Eamon O'Shea gets huge credit and deservedly so in the way the team played, but um, you know, lots of people would say to me, was he the brains behind it, Eamon O'Shea? Like to me, without without Lean Cheedy, that doesn't happen. Um, to instill that mental strength in a team, um, the that the kind of attitude that we wouldn't be beaten or that we could reach the top, that was that was unbelievable from him. And no other team was able to do it at the time with Kilkenny. Uh, they were bullying everyone, which which they should have been off the field, and he was the first man that came in and and got that that Tipperary crowd behind us, and such a brilliant win. And it was it was a fever all over Tip and Kilkenny that time. It was absolute fever pitch stuff. You know the crowds at the Kilkenny trainings. We didn't get too many at ours, but um, we knew we, we we could stop him. But you know, I, I think you're 100 correct. Come back seven or eight years later, um, and deliver an All Ireland in the first year. And even people might not remember, they have a short memory, the first team that was named in 2019 against Cork uh, in the group stages of Munster had a lot of the older players playing or a lot of the tried and tested and there was a lot of question marks from the Tipperary supporters and he answered them and he just played who he felt. Now, I suppose over the last two years, maybe people say he played him too much, but he stuck with what he taught all the time. And look, all Ireland final, all Ireland championships are hard to come by. And to win one more than after 16 with that group of players, I think it was fitting for them and it was fitting for him. There was this video that did rounds earlier in the year, Paddy, of the way Liam Sheedy communicates with his players. He screamed in the face of one fella, put his arm around the fella, the arm, uh, the, the shoulder of another fella. He, he completely knew, it seemed from the outside looking in, that, that, that the way that each of his players' brains worked. Was that your experience playing under him? Yeah, I, I would think so. Um, I would have been a in my younger days anyway, maybe not now, would have been a relatively quieter player. Um, and maybe hadn't huge confidence in myself. Um, I went into the panel as a 22 year old. So that's late, you know, and I think you can have doubts over yourself if you haven't been called in before that age. Um, and certainly himself and the backroom team put as much confidence in me as they could. Um, and I know they were trying to breed leaders because I know they, they would often try and get you to talk to the group um, you know, be more vocal within the group. I think I knew he knew what every player needed. I suppose if you look at Jamie Callan as well, tried to put a lot of confidence into him as a young player, knowing what skill he had. Um, 
but that's just the way they were. And even if I look back at Owen Kelly, Owen Kelly was like the second manager on the team. And I think him and Liam were quite close and see that they're both part of the management team for the last few years. And he was like a second manager on the team. And opposed to what maybe was going on before that, where the players were at odds with managers. And I think Liam is great to get um, a group of players going into our own direction together. And I know even after they lost the Munster final in 19, I would have talked to some of the players and they said, they were they were flabbergasted when they got beaten in the Munster final so badly because they said the, the team spirit was never as good. And I think he really, really brought that to teams. And I can remember a lot of stages, maybe you'd be traveling to games in the league and you might say, well, you know, I remember playing Limerick in Limerick in a league game and I was in college in Limerick and I was saying, maybe, maybe I drive to the game to be able to stay there for college afterwards. And he said, no, would you mind driving? I want to keep everybody together. And it was just those little things that created the team spirit. And I suppose that was probably especially. Can I just ask Paddy, how did he instill that confidence in you? Was was there any anything that he did in particular that, that allowed you to grow in that way? Well, uh, personally, uh, I think speaking to you on your own level, um, individually, uh, he would often do that. Uh, and I think he knew the lads to talk to a lot. He wouldn't talk to me a lot. And I think that was good for my own preparation. Um, but one-on-one -on -one meetings happened, and they happened once or twice a year. And it was really something where you felt um, that you could say out your side of things like if i wasn't playing i know i wasn't playing well in my first year um, and there was one-to-one -one meetings and i suppose i wasn't that confident to go and pull management during the year um you know off my own back so when they were scheduled i was able to get things off my chest and that's what really started the ball rolling for me um i also think like you know i was talking to somebody the other day there'd be a lot of video work and analysis and showing you where you went really well and maybe especially before the match i think most teams do it now uh, but really trying to drive players' confidence up by showing the good aspects of, of how we play. And I think that's important. Like, we grew up for years, and anything that was shouting from the sideline was highlighting their bad points, and, Jesus, why did you do this? Why did you do that? Very little of that from Liam Sheedy. He was always trying to get as much positivity on the field uh, as possible. And uh, I think you'd even notice that in the sideline. You'd never see him berate his players, because he knew, you know, he trained them, and he was always trying to get them to the best level uh, that he could. Um, I remember we did a thing in Satanta with him and uh, the end of the interview was always like, oh, give us a, a book you'd recommend. And he his um, recommendation was Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. I was like, wow, this is not what I expected from a GA manager. This is 10 years ago, you know, mm. it was b before the... Um, the Pat Gilroy and uh, and what came after in in Dublin with Jim Gavin, and that was like a book written in 1936. That obviously, he's like he he was he was somebody who brought the world of outside and his successful career in banking to bear on the organisational side of things and on the fundraising side of things, and brought Tipperary to the point where they could go toe to toe with whatever was happening. That was like a massive injection of professionalisation off the field as well in that first era. And the other thing that I just wanted to bring up here, Paddy, was that there was definitely a sense of unfinished business that he, he left, probably because his, his career was taken off, that he, he felt like he had to step away to make sure that that part of his life was being secured. But I know that within your setup, that there was definitely some players who felt like there was unfinished business and that he'd stepped away just one one year too early or two years too early the first time around. Yeah, I I mean, there was extreme disappointment. I know that much. I can, I can actually still remember being in the library in UL uh, getting that text through and like I wouldn't have the best memory so it kind of was one of those moments where were you when you heard about it um, I think Lark Harwood spoke about it you know that he felt kind of you know very very down after it. but I suppose you just knew and I suppose the most experienced players knew how hard it was to get a good manager a really good manager a top manager and that they don't actually come around all that often and we knew what we had with Liam um, but I think if you look at inter-county management it's it's all encompassing. Like you have your nine to five job anyway, but I'm sure that's even taken over with this. this you're managing 30 players, but that's only the start of it. The county board, uh, the supporters club, the other, the management team that, that you're dealing with every day, the analysis crew, the physios, like you can imagine the hours and hours that go into this. And let's be honest, this is the, the you know, this is these people's um, passion in life. Okay, we all love work. And some people are lucky enough to, to have it as their passion. But hurling, for hurling people, is their passion. And football the same. So I would say this has taken up so many hours. And I can't blame him for, you know, for walking away the first time or, or this time now. Because even this time, I think it's obvious that 
Chip probably needs somebody to stay, not steady the ship, but maybe pursue different avenues of players and styles of play over the next two or three years. So, you know, him to stay on for one year probably wasn't an option. And I think to say, to say he might stay on for two or three more years, that would mean a six-year tenure. I think that's just too much to ask. Is Liam Cahill the obvious successor? I think he's the obvious one. Um, I certainly do think he's the obvious one. And, and a couple of reasons. Number one, obviously, he's gone to Waterford straight away and he's got a hop. You know, he's got that bounce off the players. He's got real buy-in from the players, the supporters, and the, the, the county board. And that's very, very attractive. Like, that is shown on paper, I can do it at inter-county level. I suppose the second little part of that is a lot of the players that Tipperary, the Jake Morrises, the Mark Hughes, Paddy Cadells, all these young players in Tip, they've worked under Liam Cattle. And if you talk to people that have played under him, you know, you'd say the large majority of them would absolutely do anything for him. Like that, they go through a brick wall for him. And that's what I've heard multiple times over the last while. Now, I don't know, is the timing right for all included? Um, I have heard a couple of other names, maybe even Terry Egan, I'd know him very well from, from playing with him all the way underage. And he's, you know, he's a selector at the minute with Tipperary, very forward thinking person. So he is somebody else I think is in the mix at the minute as well. So you just don't know. I think if Liam Cahill, you know, is offered the job, as much as say he's getting a lot out of Waterford, which he is, and they'd be disgusted to lose him, it would be very hard to turn down, I think, myself. And the only reason is, if you, if you want to wait in this business, you just don't know what will happen next year or the year after. It mightn't be available for five or six years after after this. And by that time, the players he trained at under 20 and under 21 level will be well moulded in the inter-county circuit. So uh, Liam Cal is probably the obvious choice. But you know yourself in this game, you know, anything could happen. Yeah, I, look, if, if the system is working properly, you know, you get your experience with the county at inter-county level, at underage level, and it's even better if you can go off and get some senior inter-county experience and it just so happens his two-year term is up there. So, I don't know. Yeah. Are there any other viable contenders at this stage? The only one I'm hearing is, is Dara Egan, right. who's, who's involved at the minute with Tipperary. Um, uh, what, what I'd say is, Tipperary probably need a, just a little alteration in the way they're going about things. I think Tipperary looks like they're playing the same hurling that they did maybe in 16. And maybe if you go back into 14, uh, I, I was still playing at that stage where we play a lot of sort of angled balls from, from long distances into our forward line, into Shamie Callanan, which is fine. But I think the windows of getting that ball, we've talked about before, the windows to hit the ball into your full forward line are getting so small now that I think the ball needs to be worked up a little bit uh, more up the field and then you can hit a fast ball into a full form. I suppose if you looked at Liam Cahill, he plays a lot of that hurling. He plays that style. Mikey Beavens is the, is the coach and they run that ball very, very hard. Um, and they did when they were over to minors and under 20s as well. So um, that looks like the game plan. That's the modern age. Um, I, I I would, you know, I'd be, I'd be as happy as anyone to see Liam Cahill take it. But alternatively, uh, if, if it was the likes of Darigan, I think they'd be very well set too because he has, you know, he has a huge hurling brain. But I, apart from that, I can't see anybody else that would be in line. Baron O'Kelly Kelly was involved at the minute as well. I, for, for a bit of continuity, I can't see anybody else. Um, and, and I've racked my brain. So I'd say it'd be any of the pick of one of those. Okay, one, one last question for you. Um, Brendan Maher, a club mate of yours, retired after one of the great GA careers. And again, you know, sometimes we, we can overblow these things, but um, basically won absolutely everything there was for the game uh, on offer and was always incredibly classy on and off the field as well. Yeah. Um, I look, at he, he's, you know, I was lucky enough to play beside him since he's a very, very young age um, with my club and I, I'll continue to, thank God, but um, he's had an unbelievable career. I think even if you look at 2010, you know, Lark Harbour was hurler of the year officially, but the matter was probably the unofficial hurler of the year that year. And he was 20, 21 years of age. Um, and that group of players were carrying the team against, you know, we always talk about one of the best teams of all time, Kilkenny. And from such a young age, I can't imagine to be trying to do that at 20, 21 years of age. And he was certainly to the forefront of that. And I can even remember in the dressing room as being a very, he was a very vocal leader at that stage. And um, in 2011, he was unfortunate, he broke his ankle. But I remember before that, looking at a few, we were playing a few league games and just thinking he's by far the best player in the country at the moment. And I think the brilliant thing about him, obviously he'll have, have gone on over and on the show before, is he, he was so flexible in what he could do. You know, I've seen him play as a forward, a really like prolific forward for his club, for our club. But I've seen him man mark, 
seen him playing the full back line, I've seen him playing in goals. So I don't think if you give him enough time at anything on a hurling field, I think he would have mastered. And that's the way he is mentally, but he also has it obviously skillful wise. So he's had an unbelievable career. Uh, we we're very proud of him, especially I think one of his best moments in 2016 to captain an All Ireland winning team. And I suppose bringing it back to Boris Lee is something he won't forget, and I certainly won't forget it either. No, he totally deserved it as well. Paddy, good stuff. Thanks a million for the immediate reaction this morning. Cheers. No better, Thank you. Paddy Stapleton, as I said, giving us some immediate reaction to the news that, uh, as it stands, Tipperary are looking for a new hurling manager. Liam Sheedy has stepped down after another successful term, one in all Ireland this time, one in all Ireland the last time, and uh, really re established Tipperary at the top tier of hurling. You forget about the chaos that had preceded it Owen Kelly being dropped, Brendan Cummins being dropped. Fairly remarkable stuff when you think back to it.